Over here, Dolly. Come on. Free to join its own kind, this dolphin has chosen human companionship. Tell me. Are you good? Good girl. Good girl, Dolly. Come on. Yeah, are you a pretty girl? Pretty girl. Aren't you a pretty girl? <laughs> well, I don't know what that was for. Between Jean Asbury of Florida and this dolphin that came to visit and out of affection stayed, there is kinship and communication. Give mommy a kiss. Oh, beautiful. Juicy, but beautiful. You're a good girl. <laughs> We are familiar with the trained dolphin, those put on display, taught to mimic the human voice and to respond to man's signals and applause. But there are great herds of dolphins still living in freedom, too swift to be easily observed. Little is known about the dolphin in the wild. This air-breathing mammal was once an earthbound animal, but 60 million years ago, he fled the confines of land for the wide waters of open seas and became the legendary friend of gods, men, and children. Now, in the dolphin's natural domain, Captain Cousteau and divers of Calypso would explore the continuing relationship between man and dolphin, a relationship that has inspired philosophers and poets from the beginning of recorded time. suit of dolphins, Calypso cruises the waters of the Strait of Gibraltar, off the coast of Spain. Bon, vous tournez là? Ça va. Hein? Bon. Alors, Philippe, nous approchons. As they approach a dolphin herd, Captain Cousteau alerts the crew to prepare for filming. Cousteau and diving supervisor Albert Falco also plan to collect a dolphin or study at sea. Filming free dolphins is a challenge. They are too swift for divers to approach them. They never stay behind or alongside a ship, but they are attracted to the bow as to a magnet. To Calypso, we have attached an extension with an underwater camera aimed backward toward the nose of the ship. We hope the extension camera will reveal dolphins swimming head-on, never before achieved on film. Meanwhile, frolicking hitchhikers come from all directions, but the main herd continues to outrun the ship, its underwater camera boom, and all other protruding contraptions. As skipper Philippe Serrault pursues them, Cousteau fears that the new extension camera might frighten the dolphins away. But the system devised by underwater cameraman Yves Omer works. Now for the first time, front view shots of dolphins swimming freely toward camera. <laughs> Another camera mounted on the hull reveals dolphins venturing between the bow and the extension camera.
Now we can observe that the wise dolphin never swims straight ahead of the boat, but cautiously leans from side to side, ready to drop off if threatened. From the observation port, the animals are identified as the saddleback dolphin, one of 50 dolphin species belonging to the whale family. The dolphin is the littlest whale. Ever since they guided the vessels of the earliest settlers to Crete, more than 3,000 years BC, dolphins have accompanied ships. Are they in quest of man's friendship, or do they merely come to play? There are now enough dolphins off the bow to attempt the next phase of the operation, isolation of a dolphin from the herd. Falco is to be the captor. He hurries into position on the platform directly above the dolphins, riding the bow wave on starboard. The plan is to net a dolphin at full speed. Upon contact, the small net will break away from the metal fork that holds it and gently enwrap the dolphin. A buoy with a line attached is tossed to the crew in the zodiac. The line is tied to the net so that the crew will be able to haul the animal into the zodiac out of the way of the propellers of the oncoming Calypso. In the rising sea, the Zodiac has difficulty keeping up with its mother ship. Zodiac, Zodiac, de plage avant, vous pouvez y aller avec vous êtes pareil, on attend que vous, là. C'est gros, ça? Il est là, mais toujours là-bas à côté. Ça, c'est trop petit. Dolphins generally cruise at eight or ten knots but are capable of bursts of speed up to 35 miles an hour. Continually changing course, they are elusive targets. Falco must carefully pick his dolphin and throw the net immediately ahead of it so that he does not hit the dolphin with the net's metal fork. It's a miss. They will have to quickly retrieve the fork and try again before the herd is scattered. Alarmed, most of the dolphins fly away like arrows through the sea. It is impossible to pursue them. But luckily, a few have chosen to remain, riding our bow. The throw is good. Calypso is stopped to avoid hitting the entangled dolphin. The catch is clean and harmless to the dolphin. It is now up to the men in the Zodiac to slowly haul in and calm this highly sensitive creature. Our dolphin is bewildered and gives up easily to man. In ancient times, it was believed that dolphins were once men. Within their talented flippers are all the bones of our human hands. And I wonder about her brain, as large as ours, and in some ways superior. We appear to be fundamentally equal, but can we ever communicate? 
Treated with care, the dolphin will now be delivered beside Calypso, where experiments will take place. Our highly emotive dolphin has been catapulted from the exuberance of play to captivity. Yet she seems inclined to trust in us, a trust we must not betray. Men of the Calypso lower a specially designed pool. Instead of taking the dolphin to a laboratory's concrete tank, Captain Cousteau and scientists will conduct their experiments right here in the dolphin's natural environment, the ocean of its origin. Albert Falco will be the dolphin's guide and companion in the pool. If it is to be receptive to experiments, Falco must win the trust of the dolphin, now in shock. Soft of voice and touch, Bernard Delamotte passes the inert body to Falco. <laughs> dolphin authority Dr. René Guy Busnel asks if the heart continues to beat abnormally, twice the normal rate of 70 beats per minute. Falco says it has slowed down somewhat, as has the animal's breathing. Falco dares not let the dolphin submerge before all returns to normal. It could inhale seawater through its blowhole and drown. Busnell, who will supervise the experiments, cautions that it will be some minutes before the dolphin is all right. The dolphin we have detained is a young female, warm-blooded herself. She's reassured by the touch of another warm mammal. Her satin-smooth skin is highly sensitive, and she seems to feel encouraged by her gentle escort. Falco shows the dolphin the net. Bright and quick to learn, depending on both sight and sound, she surveys her environment as television cameras are installed to film dolphin echolocation. The dolphin does not attempt to jump the pool's barriers, perhaps fearing injury to her delicate skin. Aboard Calypso, we have the opportunity to record the clicking sounds of the dolphin's echolocation sonar system, as well as the whistling. Analyzing the signals on an oscilloscope and matching these to television pictures of the animal, we are able to establish an audiovisual record of behavior patterns. The dolphin emits acoustic trains of clicks from two air sacs in her forehead. Sweeping her head in a scanning motion, she hears reflected echoes of her clicks and thus locates all obstacles in her way. On the second day, the dolphin's triangular pool is rigged with radar and with three hydrophones connected to antennas at each corner. The calls of the dolphin will be analyzed on a multi-channel tape recorder. As signals and behavior patterns simultaneously recur, man may learn how they are correlated. So that the noise of the ship's props and generators will not interfere with the recording of the dolphin's vocalization, Calypso departs, leaving the dolphin behind. That evening, four miles away, Calypso radar and radio are in constant contact with the dolphin. For Dr. Alban Zizek and his animal acoustics experts, the reception is perfect, as the isolated young female calls in the night. Okay. <laughs> 
The men are struck by the consistency of the dolphin's vocalization and the emotional quality of her cries. The cries intensify. They are like those of a wounded animal. The communication whistles fall partly in the range of human hearing, but she does not call to man. She is calling to her missing herd. Our unhappy dolphin provides us with a great variety of recordings of her voice. Her lonely calls will not go unheeded. At dawn, Calypso returns. After the dolphin's night of distress, Falco would comfort Babille, the talkative one, with small mackerel, her favorite food. Simulating fish on the surface, Falco slaps the water to attract her, then tosses a mackerel. But she will not eat. She has also grown silent. Although Falco continues his overtures, she repeatedly refuses food. Dolphins are social animals and have been known to starve themselves to death when deprived of company. We will bring our lonely lady a male companion. Plans for the introduction of a companion dolphin are postponed as a storm gathers. The female in the pool will be in grave danger. Delamont and Falco must rescue her. If the dolphin becomes entangled in the wave-tossed net, she will be unable to surface to breathe and will suffocate. She is under stress and weakened from lack of food. They dare not turn her loose. With gentle urgency, her trembling body is passed to Falco and Jeunesse. She is in a state of shock. Carefully, the dolphin is brought aboard, each man reaching out, eager to help, for we are all gravely worried. She will be cared for in the protection of the holding tank. Her labored breathing tells us she's a very sick dolphin. 
Unlike man, who breathes automatically, almost involuntarily, hers is voluntary breathing. If she is allowed to slip into unconsciousness, she might stop breathing and die. Glucose serum is fed into the starving animal. She is also dehydrated. Her fragile skin is kept wet to avoid cracking, and she is tranquilized by voice and touch. All through the night, the men of Calypso keep watch. By dawn, the young female is out of shock, but now she must take solid food to survive. Falco and Delamat are closest to her. They will patiently encourage her to eat. While we gently force feed our dolphin, in another part of the world, frustrated whalers are preparing to slaughter dolphins to provide canned food for pets. Baby, lonely, dying dolphin, we have a boyfriend for you. You must eat. Voilà, c'est bien. Bravo, bravo. The young female is again in her pool. Her powerful horizontal fluke pushes her to the surface to breathe normally every 20 seconds. According to plan, a young male is lowered into the pool to keep her company. Falco attempts to orient the newcomer. The female, who knows the Met, intervenes to guide her companion around the pool herself, utilizing body contact and vocalization. Babil, the talkative one, long silent, has now fully recovered. There is a deep-seated maternal instinct in the female dolphin. Early Greeks and Romans knew this and called her species Delphis, meaning womb. After she mates, she will give birth to a single pup. She will push her newborn to the surface to breathe. This may be why dolphins have been reported since antiquity to push drowning children and sailors to the life-saving surface. Happily transformed by the presence of a male companion, and the female talks to him, touches him, guides him. They swim side by side, their body movements in harmony. It's feeding time, but there is some uncertainty as to whether the dolphins will eat in the pool. Content now, the young female is first to take food, and the newcomer follows her example. Falco pets Babiel and prays. She has been a good teacher. She has prepared the way for observation of two animals in the sea. Cousteau informs Busnel that the television cameras have been turned on. The hydrophone, too. Oui, commandant, il y a beaucoup d'échos, d'écholocations et d'essifflements. Bon, ben on va voir. Alors, uh, you see, 
our two animals swimming quietly in their prison. Oh, they look absolutely normal. Yes. And they are absolutely not stressed. Now, what do we hear on the microphone? We hear clicking and whistling. And sometimes you see, when we have the animal on the screen, the bubbles who are expelled from the blowhole. And yes. they are yeah, doing, like yeah, exactly like, like that. That is during the whistling. And the whistling is mostly used for what we call social communication. And uh, what I suggest is to uh, blindfold the animal with su suction cup and to see if the second animal helped the first one. We want to put a mask on one of absolutely, our birds. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Soft plastic eye cups are placed on the young male. The divers are careful not to cover the life-sustaining blowhole. So the animal is now blind. And, and you can hear the clicking used for the echolocation. So and it's not like the sonar system. Now look at Bernard. Bernard is hardly holding him and he's probably going to release him. The click trains range from low audible frequencies to supersonic signals, ten times higher than man can hear. Here he is. Yes. He's going exactly as if he had nothing. The ears of the dolphin, once those of a hairy land animal, have been reduced through streamlining to tiny pinholes. During auditory scanning, the dolphin receives echoes basically through the lower jaw. A strong echo on one side indicates the location of the net. The blindfolded male is also definitely being assisted by the whistling female, who continues to tell him where the net is. For this reason, Busnell now orders the female removed from the pool. For the duration of one experiment at least, her blindfolded companion will be left on his own. For an unusual test of dolphin sonar, spaced steel rods are lowered. The net with which the blindfolded dolphin is now familiar is cut and dropped to the bottom of the pool. Seeing by sound, the blindfolded dolphin uses his computer brain, much faster than man's, to locate and identify. Although he cannot see these steel rods, his sonar scans and locates them one by one. Since the dolphin's delicate skin is easily injured, he is reluctant to attempt escape by squeezing through the steel barriers he has discovered. The dolphin continues to search with sound for a wider opening, but can't find one. It is these echoes in the underwater wilderness, the dolphin's sophisticated sonar, that has come to the aid of mankind. Thanks to dolphin research, in Birmingham, England, a blind man sees with his ears. He walks with confidence as ultrasonic spectacles radiate energy and echoes come back to both ears in two-channel sonar. People and parking meters, patterns of sound, carry these pictures to his mind. And the eyes of the blind are opened by the dolphin's world of sound. Aboard Calypso, tapes of dolphin sounds are analyzed. Dolphins communicate with each other by whistling. But are they capable of language, expressing abstract ideas through words or sounds? And will they ever talk to men? The dolphin has no vocal cords, so rather than train dolphins to mimic human words, it is suggested that the dolphin be taught a whistle language, a language more natural to the animal, like that used by the people studied and taped by Busnell in the Canary Islands.
The modulations of whistling dolphins are in the same range as the Canary Island whistle people. Across the steep volcanic cliffs of Gamara, language is not spoken, but whistled. The terrain is so precipitous that people of the Canary Islands converse with bird-like calls. Whereas a shout would be lost on the wind, whistlers talk to each other from a distance up to six miles. Servando in the village asks Alenio on the mountain to relay a message to his wife, Philomena. Alenio says he will and turns to call to Philomena, a shepherd is tending sheep in the hills. Alenio continues to call. Philomena. Alenio calling Philomena. Alenio conveys the message. Her husband would like her to buy some bread on her way home this evening. In contrast to the female dolphin, this is a woman of few words. It was tempting to hypothesize that human whistlers and dolphins could learn to converse. Alas, exhaustive computer analysis proved conclusively that it was impossible. But is language really essential to every type of communication? Our young male and female are about to be returned at their herd. Even without a common language, man and dolphin have associated since the early ages. Now in Africa, Calypso cameramen and crew will investigate living evidence of the dolphin's fabled cooperation with man. In Mauritania, northwest Africa, a sound of centuries, beckoning dolphins to the aid of man, From time immemorial, the fishermen of the Amragan tribe have been dependent upon dolphins to push migrating mullet into their nets. But this season, the fish are still far from shore, and the dolphins have not yet answered the call. Led by a marabou, a religious chief, the fishermen pray for the dolphins to come. Their nets are dry, but enshrined in mythology is the dolphin's willingness to serve both gods and men. The last dried mullet of a previous catch, dwindling food supply of families dependent solely upon the sea for subsistence. A fisherman walks in the shadow of starvation. Over this land, another shadow was until recently cast by man, that of slavery. Today, still, fishermen pay tribute to desert warriors. One fish for every ten taken from the unpredictable sea. Now from the sea, not dolphin, but men of Calypso unexpectedly come to the fishermen's shores. About the year 70 AD, Pliny the Elder tells us how dolphins catch fish in partnership with human fishermen. Here, where the desert land meets the bountiful sea, we come to film what is left of that venerable report. As we seek the past, our hosts are suddenly confronted with the present. <laughs> Tribesmen are puzzled by the wetsuit of Jean-Claire Rion, 
in texture so very much like that of the missing dolphin. In a mixed reception to Riyadh, some women and children display fear. Others indicate bewilderment. Our interpreter tells Riyadh the people are not so much afraid of him as they are curious, questioning whether or not he's a normal man. <laughs> No Imragen has ever been a blond man, and Rian has a fair beard and a black body. Is Rian a real man or some kind of dolphin man? <laughs> the male dolphin has his reproductive organs within the abdominal cavity for streamlining. What about Rian? He has the beard of a man. What about the rest of him? Rayon is now obliged to strip off his wetsuit to prove his case. Rion is, after all, a mere mortal. The merriment is cut short, as some take exception to the crew's presence. Some feel the presence of strangers might somehow continue to keep the dolphins away. They keep trying to lure the dolphin by simulating the sound of leaping mullet close to shore. Changes in the color of the sea indicate mullet are still migrating. But where are the dolphins? At last, far at sea, a fin. But it's not a dolphin. They're killer whales. The Calypso team sets out to drive off the dolphin's prime predator. Dolphins flee in terror when they see the great sword-like dorsal fin or hear the powerful underwater whistle of the killer whale. We understand now why dolphins have not appeared. We know that before they can possibly show, this pack of their dangerous cousins must be turned away. Up to this time, we have been somewhat skeptical about the dolphins' voluntary cooperation with the fishermen of Mauritania. But now, as the killer whales depart, we find ourselves actively involved in that legend. As the fishermen wait, they play desert chess on the sand with sticks and dried goat pellets. And wait. And still they wait.
we too take turns calling the dolphins. In the worlds of Plutarch, the dolphin has no need of any man, yet is the friend of all men. To the dolphin alone has nature bestowed the gift of disinterested friendship. And still, for evidence of his friendship, an anxious camera crew and stoic fishermen wait. Suddenly, a dramatic color change out at sea. Dolphins at last, driving mullet before them. And on the wind is a sound of dolphins. So cameramen will have to make quick decisions to capture the lightning raid of these climax predators. A dolphin turns a mullet around in its mouth, swallows it head first and whole. It is a mass migration up shore where the water boils with mullet. Swift dolphin encircle mullet, bunching them into violent explosions. Buznal is amazed at their size and how close to shore they fish. Corralled mullet are driven toward the fishermen, now joyously entering the water with their nets. Boys join their fathers in the excitement, learning an ancient but relevant trade. In murky water, dolphins cannot see. Sending signals, receiving echoes, the dolphin instantly computerizes speed and location of the fleeing fish. The hunting dolphins encircle and drive great schools of mullet into the fishermen's gill nets. Stretching their individual nets together, the men create a collective seine to entrap their frantic prey. Omer attempts to photograph the action underwater. The water is murky, but he can hear the dolphin's sonar clicks as they pursue the fish in eruptive flight. What is for man a vital windfall is for the dolphin a gluttonous orgy. As for the yellow mullet trapped by these formidable allies, it is a pathetic ordeal. Yet their species is not in jeopardy, for 90% of them get away. This spectacular display of interspecies cooperation has the dolphin traveled all the way from the open sea just to help man by driving these fish into his nets? Or is the dolphin actually using man and his nets in order to gather a gargantuan feast for himself? Plutarch's disinterested friendship between man and dolphin, like happy marriages, should not be overanalyzed. Rewarding enough in a good partnership 
if both sides get their share. Off the shores of Mauritania, tons of mullet are taken during the seasonal migration. Women will clean and dry the catch, and the highly prized roe will be sold in Mediterranean marketplaces. For the fishermen who waited so long, gill nets are now heavy with harvest, thanks to the dolphins who answered their call. The Calypso crew has filmed a legend and found special empathy with those who live it. Dolphins may never talk to man, but in Mauritania, brought together by the dolphin, man talks to man. <laughs> That night, the immigrants celebrate abundance brought by the dolphins. Songs and dances are human expressions of joy. Dolphins, too, are capable of joy, and we wonder if they also celebrate. We know the swift and clever dolphin has no problem finding his daily food without the help of man. Most of his time is spent in leisure, traveling thousands of miles, leading an intricate social and emotional life, diving maybe four million times in a 40-year lifespan, sometimes as deep as 1,000 feet, and playing, too playing all day long. As man himself returns to the ocean, his best friend remains the dolphin, living spirit of the sea. <laughs> <laughs> 